For those of you who haven't been uh, to one of the Design Is talks before, uh, we started this back in March to create a space and time for the design community to come together and uh, explore, discuss, talk about the role that design has in crafting a future that we all want to be a part of, particularly as we move into these new uncharted technological realms um, where there is potential to dramatically impact people's lives. So um, we really appreciate you guys all coming to join us in this conversation. So um, Josh uh, works at the intersection of uh, interaction design, machine learning, and unconscious bias awareness. Um, and he leads uh, design and strategy for Google's um, ML uh, fairness effort. And Jess is a UX manager and UX researcher um, in the machine intelligence group, the research and machine intelligence group. They both work together. And he focuses on democratizing AI, um, how democratizing AI can really um, help people to solve uh, meaningful problems. And we are very, very lucky to have them here today. And I have also uh, been lucky enough to have worked with both of them, and um, they are really fantastic people. So thank you so much for being here. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to both of you. Great. Great. Thank you, Kai. Uh, hey, everybody. I'm Jess. Uh, Josh. We're going to talk to you here uh, for about an hour today. Um, and what we're going to go over, you know, our, our talk is, is entitled Design is Smart. And so we're going to really kind of hopefully communicate to you some of the things we've learned as UXers working with machine learning and AI uh, over about the past three years. And this is a collection of stuff we forgot, we found out by working directly on products, uh, by thinking we were pretty smart and doing some dumb things and learning from them and then kind of iterating and, and moving on and on and from there. And so what we're hoping is that this is going to kind of accelerate all of your knowledge about how to really like use AI and machine learning as a medium. Uh, as a UXer and, and to start to influence the products as much as you can. A lot of the material from this talk is from a talk we gave internally at Google a bunch, and this became a Medium blog post that we did. I don't, some of you may have seen it. So we're going to cover some of the same thing in there, but we actually have a lot more space to get into a lot more detail that we didn't have a chance to do in that article. Um, and we're going to cover five kind of big things here. So the first is the what. Um, so we're actually going to kind of just talk about AI today, there's a lot of hype around it. There's a lot of jargon around it. And so we're going to kind of like walk through really from a product-centric view of like what AI is and kind of what it can do. We're going to talk about the how. We're going to try to get into some of the core concepts, but really from a product-first perspective. This is really important and can be one of the most daunting parts, because if you as a UXer don't understand actually how some of this really works, you're never going to get in there into the deep conversations uh, with engineering and product teams. We're going to cover a few of the myths. So we've also found that you know, talking to, I don't know how many hundreds of UXers at this point, there's just some funny myths that are out there that if you dispel those, uh, it gets people past that and it gets people going really early. Uh, we're going to talk about how a UXer's work does and doesn't change when you're using machine learning and AI. There's some kind of surprising things where it's stuff you knew all along and it's a couple new things you need to think about. Um, and then we're going to close out with a big responsibility that comes with AI and machine learning. This is basically the most powerful technology wave that's come along so far, and it has the opportunity to do a lot of good, but also has the opportunity to do some not great things, and we need to think about that. Uh, so to kick us off, Josh is going to start to talk about uh, the what. First off, just some kind of basic terminology and to, to unpack, start to unpack, like Jess was talking about, to, to humanize some of this language. So AI, perhaps with the exception of a photo of the Terminator or Skynet, when we think about AI, Often it is these large mechanistic systems, you know, assembly line of many robots doing many things seemingly magically. This is also AI. So is this. Artificial intelligence is really anything where there is an automated decision being made. Uh, and in these cases, they are systems that have been programmed to have decision trees uh, hand coded by human beings. Uh, and what's distinct about machine learning as a, as a subset of AI is that these are decisions are learned. And really, when we talk about decisions, it's one more layer we have to unpack. It's predictions. So like the one thing to be cognizant of, really, of, of anything in the process of machine learning is to ask what prediction is being made here. These aren't inventions or discoveries or 
magic, uh, like just add machine learning to it and it will become smart. Um, really, we have to unpack a bunch of those assumptions so that we can effectively uh, teach the, the machines to, to make the right predictions. Uh, so some examples. Uh, this is the first of a couple shots of my kids. One, because it is allowable to show pictures of yourself and be weird to show another kid. But this is Google Photos. This is like one of the magical pieces of Google Photos where you can track sort of uh, the, the life of a person uh, seeing their face and, uh, through time in a bunch of different scenarios. So what I'm going to kind of go through in, in, a, in the next set of examples is what are the predictions and a little bit of what's happening. So what's the prediction here? The prediction is this face, assuming we've recognized it's a face, is the same face that we've seen before by another person or in another scenario. Underlying here, there's this concept of an embedding, which you can think of like a digital signature. Um, you know, his the, the way that his uh, eyes look together in concert with his nose over time as it's grown relative to the way that most other people's features tend to evolve, we can track those kinds of small distances and start to create an awareness of what this person looks like in multiple contexts from multiple different angles. So prediction, this person is the same person. This is an example of Google's new Google Lens product. It was unveiled at I.O. There's a ton of stuff happening under the covers here, but what predictions are being made here? Well, there's predictions that those are letters, and those letters are part of a word. And that there's an image of an establishment, and that establishment belongs to some sort of category, or it matches up with another photo we might have of that from, say, Street View. So these predictions, that's a word. That, that, that photo matches up, gives us a confidence level that that is a location that we can apply attributes to. Self-driving cars, maybe one of the biggest examples we, we talk about and think about sort of in the zeitgeist of, of AI and machine intelligence, really actually most of the predictions that are being made are about following rule sets. So they're making a prediction, like are you in the lane or not in the lane? Uh, is, that a, is that stoplight? What color is that stoplight? Uh, a number of things about the direction based on the corner and the angle. Um, really, it's actually mostly heuristics, the, the sort of the the learning that happens in the context of a self-driving car are situations where it would be impossible to tell it all of the possible permutations of something like a stop sign when part of it's obscured by a tree branch, or when the light isn't so great, or when it's off its angle a little bit and it doesn't totally look like a normal stop sign looks like. So we show it many, many, many examples of stop signs and train that up, and now, OK, cool. Conditions that aren't ideal, the car can make a right prediction about if that is a time to stop. This is, uh, this is a technology called super resolution. We use this in a couple different places. The top image is a little bit blurry. And what's happening here is a prediction is being made about what pixels, ideally, you would introduce next to the other pixels to add resolution. So it's just a, it's a prediction based on showing it a lot of examples of things in the world, labeled as actual photos, actual things. But really, it's this kind of unsupervised process where it doesn't know those are eyebrows or eyes or a bridge of a nose. What it knows is the kinds of patterns and color combinations and contrast combinations. It makes a prediction about whether or not something belongs or doesn't belong. Uh, this is an example. Uh, and we actually, Sindar had one of these at the I.O. Uh, of like a kid with like a chain link fence in front being like automatically erased. This uses a, a technique where the, what prediction is being made is essentially trying to satisfy whether or not something, again, kind of belongs, if it looks right. It's an approach called adversarial learning, where there's two adversaries that this model has to sort of satisfy. It has to predict when filling in that white space, if the pixels around the white space look like they belong there. And there's a second one that tries to satisfy a global. Like, does this still look like a picture, or is this weird? Because if you've seen enough photos of like bars and windows and floors and all sorts of different things. The model is learning to make a prediction about what rightness looks like in these contexts. This is a, an API called Perspective, which attempts to predict whether or not someone's statement will cause another person to leave that conversation, to feel like it's a toxic conversation. This can go a bunch of weird directions, uh, <laughs> like super weird directions. But ultimately, what's happening here is it's called the classification. We're going to get into that in a second. But show, uh, show a model enough examples that are labeled as toxic or not toxic. Or in this case, this would cause me to leave, or this would not cause me to leave. And then you can show it new examples, and a prediction can be made about the toxicity. 
AlphaGo. This got a lot of press recently. The prediction that's trying to be made here is kind of interesting. It's, it's not so much what's the perfect next best move. It's what would the person we, that it's been trained to mimic do. So Lee Sedol, famous, famous Go player, showed a bunch of examples of his games and essentially uh, built up a model that did its best impersonation of him. And so it was trying to predict what he would have done in a given situation. So that they took that model and then they, trained, they, they had it play against another model for like infinity times and it got better at figuring out how to make better decisions. What objects are in the photo? And it's also trying to make a prediction about how you'd string those nouns together to make a sentence that looks like a real English normal human sentence. We're going to get into kind of like how this works. This is a supervised learning process. So again, I'm showing many examples to try to see what a kite looks like, what a train looks like, or brown bears. This is a prediction based on combination, again, like recognizing those are words, those are characters, and also um, a confidence level of what that translates to in another language. And this, is, this one's pretty special because it's all run locally on device. There's no, there's no internet connection here. So on the phone, there's enough information stored about characters, characters in a string, characters in concert with one another separated by spaces, et cetera, et cetera. Recognize, recognize those and make a prediction about how you'd flip around the space. There's a, a bunch of other cool stuff happening here in terms of like filling the red and then putting it back in with the right font. But ultimately, these things are still classifications of that's a word. We know what that word is in this language. We can match it to another word with using a technique called clustering. Just a couple more. This one's very near and dear to me because I actually do have real vision problems. This uses a bunch of computer vision to predict, in this case, again, letters and faces and objects to read back to a person who's visually disabled, visually impaired, what is happening in the area around them. So again, many, many examples, predictions about text, predictions about people, predictions about things, but then converted into speech and read back to a person so it can be in their ear to help them recognize, be more a part of the conversation. OK. Lots of examples. Now let's like take a little bit of a step back and do a bit of the how. As Jess talked about, this, this journey for us has been two and a half, three years of doing a lot of kind of trial and error, a lot of error, kind of diving in deep into a system that was pretty foreign to us as UXers. We're not super technical people. But in order to, to be successful, we didn't know how much we needed to be able to sort of speak in the language of research science and machine learning. So we tried to do a lot of that. And what we're going to do in the next 10 minutes or so is unpack what we think are the most fundamentally important concepts that we wish somebody had told us about so we didn't have to go learn all of the other stuff right away. This is usually what, it, what we tend to see when somebody tries to abstract out what a neural network is doing. You'll see this. And then you see kind of a hop, skip, and a jump over to like beautiful mind on a blackboard with many <laughs> equations. And there's not much middle ground. So that's our goal here is middle ground. It's not magic. This kind of is a little bit of magic, like cat or dog, nodes in space, dog. Um, and then not so far into the crazy math land. One big thing, if you've ever taught anyone anything ever, you already know how to do machine learning. So take a moment, you're already all most likely experts on this stuff. What we need to just walk through are a few pieces of terminology and kind of jargon, to be totally frank, that help translate a lot of the concepts that we are comfortable using when we talk about early childhood development or onboarding a user and translate those into machine learning talk. More photos of my kids. So my younger son has this book that he loves and kind of drives me crazy, but it's machine learning in child format. It's this book where uh, page after page, it's just tons and tons of examples of things like fruit or vegetables or animals. And around the perimeter, it's like, there are six tigers in this photo. Can you find them all? And he loves this book. And I'm cool with that because if he's happy, then everything's good. But uh, so we go through this process of showing and pointing and putting a name to something, and then talking about what that thing is. And then later on, we do it again in a situation where he hasn't seen that before. So what are we talking about? Features. Features are descriptions. They're any little detail. This is the bedrock. Like the atomic unit of machine learning is a feature. 
It's like a pattern, it's a color. We're gonna talk about some details of that just to unpack it a little bit further. Features of a YouTube video, the length of the video, the colors in this frame, the number of views on that video, the height and width and pixels of that video, when it was posted, these are all features, you know, like there could be, there could even sort of deeper, more nuanced things like a swatch to cut out from that video that gives us a little kind of color, tone, or pattern. Features in a map, square footage of, of a building, number of floors, number of lanes in a road, distance, length of a road, how old a building is, what color a building is, like if this is grass or water, Features, they're just details. More examples. Text, text is well down to these features that are called n-grams, which is essentially as small as one character, or then couplets of characters, triads of characters, whole words, and those, that gives us features, basically different ways that, uh, that, those word, that those letters appear in succession or those words appear in succession. We use those and we try to like go over and over again until we we can show it as many examples of those different combinations. And then back to my kids, faces. So this is like the, a little bit of a, this is a decent representation of what sort of the, the machine sees, so to speak, when we talk about features. Again, when we looked at that, that, that example of like my older son growing through time and it matched up who he was, what it's trying to do with that embedding is take all these little points, like where his eyes go and the, the aperture, the opening of his eyes, the distance from the angle of his mouth, between nostrils, skin tone, hair length, all these little this, all these little details get boiled down and we can then talk about them in terms of this abstraction we call a face. You show enough example of faces and it learns that these kinds of pigments and patterns and relationships and distances are face-ish. And then we can do all sorts of crazy other stuff. In this case, a classifier that doesn't really understand how to do emotion very well. Um, so apparently they have no expression, which is not right. Prediction, we talked about this before, but the prediction comes in a couple different flavors. We talked about it in kind of like a, a certain <coughs> spoken language, but everything is just a zero to one value. And, and there's four flavors of doing prediction. There's classification. And so in that case, the zero to N value is a confidence level. How confident is this model that this thing fits into a category? That's a face, that that's a kite, that that's, those are waves, that that's a person, confidence level. If it's 0%, it's super confident that it's not that thing. It's 100% super confident that it is that thing. It's kind of weird. 50%, I have no idea, or it has no idea. Classification. So. We've got features, showed a lot of features, try to classify those into something that, that has a confidence level, one form of prediction. Second form of prediction, regression. It's as simple as like, it's a number. That's it, trying to predict a number. And in this case, with maps, it'll be like, how long will it take to get from point A to point B? That's a prediction that's being made based on things like historical data, on the length of the road, on the average speed limit, a bunch of these details that you run through enough times, and it's trying to fit a path that seems most likely to occur. So regression, number. Clustering, predicting how related things are. These things are really, really similar to one another. These things are not similar to one another. Um, an example here that's really interesting is sort of like how I can misspell the word presentation as I'm doing a search in Google Drive. And that's similar enough to the word presentation and other forms that it, it's fine. It, it forgives that mistake. And then I start to see other presentations that have clusters, similarities in the language that's used uh, in the names of those files. Uh, another example, really like from a utility oriented perspective, is the, the relationship or the similarity between ads so that we don't show the same user, the same ad over and over and over again, despite subtle differences being made by whoever is trying to get you to look at that ad for a bus or whatever that is. We're good. Clustering, similarity. And then sequence prediction, so finally, what comes next? And again, that's all based on like, we know historically that these things happened and preceded this thing. So in this case, this is super useful as you start swiping and moving around on a keyboard. The prediction that's being made is the likelihood that the user is going to move their finger into another region. And the decision that can come out of that is enhancing like the touch target size or the radius for sort of like where is an acceptable landing point. Because if you start from 
you know, B and you go to A, it's probably far more likely than B to S, although that didn't work so well in the example I just made up in my head. Anyway, confidence level of what comes next. So those are the four flavors of the prediction. So we talked about features. We said it's either is or isn't a thing. It is part of a group. It is a number, or it's what comes next. And that's kind of like the, 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 the core recipe of everything we're doing in machine learning as designers. We get to ask, what are we trying to predict? We say, how do we know that we're going to make an accurate prediction? What have we shown it in the past that would be representative features, representative details of this thing? And what's the format? Is it, again, similarity, what comes next, number, or is or is not a thing? OK. And then supervised learning, this is, we're just going to quickly kind of talk through the sort of the most, most core uh, approaches to sort of educating the machine. We label the things we care about, and the model learns. So again, back to our fruit example. Supervised learning with my son looks like pointing to a strawberry and saying strawberry. Then pointing to another strawberry and saying strawberry. These are my labels. I'm applying labels to things. That's ground truth. We know that that's true, because in theory, I'm an adult who knows what a strawberry is. I've labeled it. Uh, I am a rater in this case. That's a word you might hear the word like crowd worker or click worker or crowdsource. But my job in this case is to specifically apply a label. And I've given training data. These are examples. Now I show evaluation data. These are things I have not pointed to. I pointed to these two, and I said those are strawberry. I did not point to these two. Nobody saw me do that. Evaluation data. Evaluation is then saying which one of these is a strawberry. And by showing him an example that he hasn't seen before, it's not testing his ability to memorize it. It's testing his ability to predict. And what are the features? Well, reddish, a certain pattern, this little green thing at the top, there's a certain shape. Those are things that he's picking up quickly. But to train a model, you need to do that like 100,000 times. So it's a huge difference of scale. The other thing that humans are far better at is handling exceptions. I can just show him an example that is a kind of strawberry he's never seen before and tell him that it's an unripe strawberry, and that's why it's not red. And he can get that and deal with it. So there's a size of scale and magnitude that is like a core difference in what we're doing here as human-centered machine learning. And overfitting is this concept of when training examples, and they're just too limited to allow the model to know how to deal with new cases. I like to use an example literally of clothing overfitting. If you didn't have enough examples and you tried to establish like small, medium, large, then maybe you'd have tailor-made perfect fitting clothing for like the 10 people that you sampled from. But then a new person will come along, and they have a different body type, and they don't fit neatly into that category. And it's why someone like me doesn't actually have fine clothes very easily, because I'm way too tall. I'm 6'6", six, six, and I don't fit into like any normal band or range. And so it's this funny aspect of like, oh, yeah, right. When you think about fitting into any one of these categories, you have to at least find some notion of normal or mean. But it's why you need a lot of examples to know how wide that band needs to be. And then I think this is maybe like the, there's just a couple more concepts. I know this is like a big download. but um. The confusion matrix, true to its name, is the most confusing part of maybe this whole thing. But if we've established sort of how we teach it and what we teach it with and in what method, this is these kind of four big categories of where stuff lands. And it's on this axis talking about what the source material was, the reference. Sometimes people talk about this as like the true things, but truth is a little bit of a relative construct. And prediction which is what, was, what did the model actually predict? And again, going back to all of our types of prediction. So the places we want to be in are the true positive land, where the source material told us something, and then we asked the model, we showed the model a new thing it hadn't seen before, and it predicted it correctly. Or where the source material was clearly labeled as not a strawberry, and correctly said, that's not a strawberry. OK, that's a true negative. True positive, true negative, good things. Bad things are a false positive. So that's where, um, that's where it is truly not a strawberry, but predicted to be positive. We don't want that. Uh, and a false negative, uh, where it was actually a strawberry, but predicted not to be. So these are these four categories. They're kind of wonky. It uses a lot of like double negatives and, and 
and sort of weird, weird language. But essentially, that's where things distill down into. And Jess is going to talk through a couple examples of where we might want to like skew more in one direction versus another, because it matters. And those are success criteria that we get to, we are empowered to control. That's not just stuff that like is you know comes out of nowhere. Someone gets to choose if it's more important to um, make sure that your false positive rate is low versus your false negative rate. You can have different impacts in different contexts. Finally, the last two examples, again, just getting back to kind of like the way stuff is, the way we, we teach machines how to understand stuff. This is an unsupervised learning, which is basically mostly about clustering stuff, showing many, many examples and letting it pour through all these examples and see what similarities it finds. Uh, this is an example of using unsupervised learning to try to understand sentiment. So it's trained off of Amazon customer reviews. So the ground truth here, at least, there is some little bit of labeling of like if this was useful or in, and the star rating. So if somebody like liked the product or didn't like the product. Showed enough examples of that and then essentially let the model figure out what good language looks like when someone's happy and what unhappy language looks like. Um, the weird thing that happens, again, from like a, if, if we let, if we just let this stuff run wild, is this stuff gets started, starts getting applied to like the way that people have conversations with one another to determine sentiment. Like the way that I talk to my friend is very different than how I write a review about a product. So training data is not all equal. And then finally, reinforcement learning. This goes back a lot of the, to the AlphaGo example, to the self-driving car example. So in reinforcement learning, it's all, it's kind of like game playing, really. There's an actor and an environment. So the actor takes a move, and the environment responds with a reward or a lack of a reward. So in the self-driving car example, that's like moved forward, didn't run into something, keep going forward, good. This makes it look much more complex. It is very complex. This is training a model how to play a game. Uh, again, this is from our friends, the friends at DeepMind, trying to help it navigate a maze. So it gets to take actions about direction, and it's getting rewards based on running into stuff and not running into stuff and speed of, of moving through the space. And then every time it runs through over and over again, it gets that feedback and it gets that stimuli and learns what to avoid and what to move towards uh, just over time. I know that was a lot. We spent like three years trying to figure that stuff out. <laughs> All right, so Jess is going to talk us through some of the myths now. And this is going to get a little bit more into the practical aspects of this and hopefully kind of relating a lot of those concepts that we just blasted through and taking it into the, the practical work that, that we do in our in our day to day. You know, good design is taking something very complex and simplifying it, right? That was a tremendous amount of information. Now that you have some of those kind of core concepts, we want to go over the myths and then how the work changes. There's a couple of these myths and some of them maybe already be, been dispelled at this point, but, but I want to cover them. So a big one is actually people really kind of conflate artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I think we've kind of covered this, but you know, AI is just kind of this catch-all for like any kind of automated decision making, whereas machine learning is really unique because uh, you know, instead of manually tuning the decision tree, meaning somebody goes through and codes and says, this is everything that this system will ever do and it's hard coded in here, um, they're learned and the system can actually kind of continue to learn as well. The second big one that we come across when we talk to people is this notion we call like the AI monolith. So is anyone working, like anyone in the crowd, is anyone working on like a product right now that uses AI or machine learning or like somebody on your team has said, hey, we're going to put AI on this? Okay, a couple people. So what we thought this meant from when we started to do this was like there's nothing and we're going to build all AI up from the ground. And how it usually actually works is like there's this teensy little AI cherry on top of like a giant system that already exists. And actually a lot of times this AI does something extremely narrow that is useful. So like the examples that Josh was giving, like there's no Skynet example in there, or no like big general intelligence example, right? It's like we need this thing to be able to identify faces. And so you put this tiny little piece of AI like kind of on top that can now enable the, the platform to, to understand faces. And so I think that's a big part too is like, to understand that this is a piece of a much larger system you need to design. Um, the third one that we hear too is this notion that like an AI doesn't need a human and this is really prevalent in like the public narrative about kind of AI like not needing people or running amok or whatever, blah, blah, blah. The thing that we've realized is like a human and especially a, a designer or a UXer needs to intervene and needs, needs to provide supervision at like almost every single step of like 
designing the system, training it, evaluating the data, iterating on it, and especially when you're designing like what happens when the system has errors, because there's no perfect machine learning or AI system. Every single one of them has errors, and that's a very important thing uh, for us to design and get, and get that right. This is also sometimes called a human in the loop. Um, we're very big on that, of like a human should be in the loop at every stage of AI development and use. The fourth big one, and Josh touched on this a bit as well, is there's sometimes this fantasy that like data are neutral. Um, there's sometimes this fantasy of like, oh, well, if we apply AI to this system, it will actually remove a bunch of the problems with human judgment or human errors or things like that. The problem with that, though, is algorithms are trained on data that's collected by and about humans. So you know when Josh mentioned multiple times, like, you kind of just need to show it like 100,000 of this or a million of this or whatever? Those data sets come from somewhere, and those data sets are oftentimes collected by people. Um, well, they're almost always collected by people. But they have uh, some forms of embeddings in them. And, and you know, one of the ways we can think of this is they, they have in them our preferences, our opinions, and our biases are embedded into this data. A really canonical example is a lot of times people use a set of photos on Flickr to, 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 do, to show something. Like, that's not a neutral data set. It has certain values embedded into it, even the things we take pictures of, too. And we're going to kind of close out the talk, actually, with more on this in a bit, because it's very important. The fifth big myth that we hear people is like this notion that like actually perfect prediction. So Josh talked a lot about prediction and getting better, and we saw that picture where it was like 99% confident, 87% confident, all this kind of stuff. There's kind of this notion that like perfection is the goal, and it's probably not, and probably not possible in a lot of systems. You know, if a human can't do it, an AI probably can't do it yet. Um, and we've also found that perfect prediction is not always the best UX either. So through some of our product work, we found that actually giving people a bit of choice and actually not presenting them with what we're confident is the very best prediction and no agency at all is not as good as actually presenting a bit of maybe what we don't think is the top prediction, but allowing the person to control the system a bit more and exert some agency in there. And I think that that's going to be a really important thing as AI starts to pervade a lot of the products and experiences we have. And so now I want to get into the work. So this is really about like how you as a UXer, how your job changes and how it doesn't when you've been, you know, the product manager or the engineer comes and says, all right, we're, we're putting AI into this product. Or hopefully it'll allow you to actually be the one to bring that to the team. So this is another one of those one big thing slides. Like the one big thing of this whole section is like human-centered design still applies. Uh, you know, you got to start with everything you know, and you need to add a couple adjustments. And this is something that we found is that people think they need to like rework everything they know, or now they're going to be disempowered or anything like that. Everything about human-centered design still applies in this area, and it's, and it's almost more important than before. And we have like these seven big things here. So like the first one is you still need to do the hard work to find the human needs here, right? A lot of times there's kind of this notion of like we'll just apply machine learning to it or apply AI to it. None of that replaces all of the user research you need to do. None of that replaces ethnography or interviewing people or like, God forbid, talking to some people face to face instead of like looking at a metric or, or some kind of you know, data from millions of people. Um, you still have to identify that unique need and then evaluate if AI or ML can fix it in a way better than the alternative. A lot of times it's not actually that good. And that really leads to the second point. So now let's say you've identified a real need and you believe that you need to, to fix it. Then you really need to say, like, will ML address this in a need in a unique way? Um, so this is this feature in Gmail, right, where like, if you have certain phrases in there of like, see the attached, and you hit send, and there's not an attachment, it says, hey, looks like you forgot to attach the file. Could you train a machine learning system to do this? Like, you could. It would be extremely expensive. It would take a very long time. Or you could probably write up some heuristics that actually catch like 99% of it. Um, and so it's always a, a kind of weighing the costs as well. Something we really haven't gotten into in this talk is just the engineering cost of creating a lot of these systems, which can be the time of many very rare experts over months or a year. Like that's not a small thing you want to just kind of spend on any kind of problem. We also walk teams at Google through a few exercises that we found to be really, really useful kind of through our sometimes a, a variant we do on our sprint format. So one way that's really useful is we just ask people, describe the way a theoretical human expert might perform this task today. That will like expose all these steps in the process. And it will also expose how you might want that AI to interact. A really great one to think about this is like the Google Assistant or Siri or Cortana or something like that. 
of like if you had a human expert actually trying to find you movie times, how would you want that person to act? And that will be actually quite revealing to you about how the user experience should go and also how you might actually build uh, that system to get the data that you want. Another one is if a human expert were to perform this task, how would you respond to them so they could improve it the next time? This really comes back to giving feedback to the model. It's really interesting to do this for all four phases of the confusion matrix, right? What would you say to somebody, let's just again use like a, suggesting like a movie you might want to go to or something like that. How would you react to somebody who found you the movie you did want to go to? How would you react if you found out they didn't give you a movie you didn't want to go to? How would you react if they brought you a movie you didn't like or didn't recommend a movie you did like? Actually working through that and thinking about the feedback that you would give them is really useful because the feedback to these models as well is basically how they get better. So if they don't have good data, it's really going to slow them down to actually give you better predictions in the future. If a human were to perform this task, what assumptions would the user want them to make? Again, the UX is like, what things do you want to predict? What things does the person want predicted for them versus what do they want to actually make a decision for themselves and want to be asked? And then what we do is we take a lot of ideas. So we generate a lot of ideas about what a particular machine learning AI system can do. And we kind of just go to a two by two. It's an age old way to kind of prioritize things. So what you have is on that y axis, you have user impact. Is this going to like change the world? Or is this going to like get rid of like a tiny little problem that maybe some people have? And then you look at the ML dependency. So does this problem need machine learning to actually solve it? Or does it really not? And we'd kind of be over engineering the system. Everything in basically the top right is what you go do. That's the important stuff that's going to make people's lives better that needs machine learning to do it. That's where the focus lies. And that's a way that we actually kind of prioritize what a product team might work on. The third thing is with a lot of the machine learning systems, it's like you have to fake it with personal examples and a lot of Wizard of Oz testing. Um, so this is kind of one of these weird things. Like I said, the machine learning systems take a long time to develop. You can't like prototype it all that quickly with a, with a, a, a system that works. So a really good way around this is actually to have people bring in their own data, like their own photos, their own chats, their own whatever, uh, and try to plug those into a fake system. Um, to start to say like, okay, I'm gonna like suggest to you a photo that you brought in for me, and you now you see the photo that you saw. Another really great one is chatbots. So people are doing this a ton with chatbots as they're trying to make them like interactive and easy to use and all this kind of stuff. This is like the easiest thing to Wizard of Oz in the world. Um, for those of you who are like too young to remember Wizard of Oz testing or whatever, it's basically where like you pretend like a system can do something, but it's really a human doing it like next in the next room. Chatbots are perfect because you basically have a human texting like they are this chatbot that the person is talking to. And you can learn like an insane amount by doing this about how that chatbot should behave, uh, what kind of personality elements are fun and, and nice and which are just annoying. Um, so being able to actually simulate these things with just another human acting like the AI is really, really powerful because then as the UXers, you can really lay down the right experience very early on for this engineering system that might take months or more uh, to develop. You also really have to be very cognizant of the, the costs of false positives and false negatives. So back to the confusion matrix, right? You know, when Josh was talking about this, about how important it is, this is in a lot of ways like just the absolute truth of an AI system. Um, and so you have to actually make a trade-off between two concepts. So one is called precision and one is called recall. And there's no easy answers in this. This is actually one of those things that I think UXers should be designing that we're not right now. Precision is actually basically about excluding errors and making sure only, only things in there are correct. And recall will allow in some errors, but will make sure that all the answers are in there. For this example, we're talking about like bad ads or spammy ads. So in this case, you have to decide which of these two is more important, and it's kind of like a line that you move. So if you have bad or spammy ads, precision is more important than recall. It's more important to miss showing somebody who would want to see these ads than it is to show them more broadly. And that's because a lot of times they're offensive to people or they're just wasted money uh, for the advertiser. A counterexample where recall is more important than precision is maybe if you're doing some kind of search on photos. So in this case, if you searched on playground and you got these photos, you know, at the top there, this, that's this little area outside of our office up in Seattle. It's not technically a playground, but it's kind of OK that it's there, right? There's not a big cost to that error, in a way. And so it's much more important to broaden that out and maybe let a few photos that aren't playground in 
to make sure all the photos, the playground are there. Another big part is you have to plan for co-learning and adaption. So as these systems are more dynamic, not only does the system's behavior change, but the user's behavior changes. Actually, one of the canonical examples I always use here is, uh, you know on Pandora, when you thumbs up a song and you kind of like get more of that song, you create a station or whatever, and then a song you like comes up in a channel where you don't want that song associated with that channel? Has anyone ever had that? So now you're playing like calculus of like, do I actually like this song or not in this channel? And what we want to get away from is that kind of thing. So you're actually adapting your behavior to the system, and now it's going to adapt to you. And so there's a lot of places where you can actually give uh, feedback on the system. So this is like in Google uh, Now, um, where you can give feedback about if something is useful or not. With search results, you can actually give really good feedback about where are some predictions inappropriate, where you can have some uh, different options there. And so again, a couple examples of how people are going to adapt their behavior to the system, and the system's going to adapt to that. And that's something you need to plan on. And one of the best ways to do that is actually to get a system going and do more longitudinal user research. So this is stuff that can't come out in two hours in the lab or anything like that. This is sticking with people and actually seeing how they use a the system over time. Labels are the new mock-ups. So this is an interesting one. This is a big part of how the system works. And this is something that almost nobody's designing that is a huge area in need of design. Josh mentioned the raters earlier. So this is like a Google Center it's in Hyderabad where people are labeling. So they'll get a raider task where they're labeling these data sets to train the various models. This is a look at, here's some examples of like what they do. So they get a task and it says, label these sections of this video. Which part of that is falling into the water and which part is surfing? You can then use that data to actually train a model to understand what's in the video. Here's one about finding flight details. Here's one about the accuracy of an eBay page. They're filling out these forms. And here's one that's a little bit about like how to determine what kind of hairstyle somebody has. So as the designers in the room are probably looking at this and going, that's really nice. That's really good design right there. As you can see, this is like super crazy rough. And what's interesting about this space, though, is efficiency is everything. If you can design a task that takes half as much time as the previous one, you probably just saved your company hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. The other really interesting thing is sometimes you can actually unlock AI possibilities that weren't there before simply by efficiency. So like we've been saying, whenever you start to kind of label some of this data, you're always kind of testing it, seeing how good it is. And by how good it is and how, good, how much better it's getting, you can predict how long it will take you to have a model that actually works. And sometimes you do that prediction, and it's like four years and $50 million or something like that. And you're like, OK, we can't do it. It's not worth it. But if a designer can come in and reduce that down, you can actually like uh, enable brand new AI possibilities by like making the raider's task better. This is one of those mind-blowing things. This is probably the one that you're almost familiar with. So this is a raider task. And you didn't know it, but you're all raiders. And so this is CAPTCHA and reCAPTCHA. So the end burglary example, you know, this is you actually labeling text in old books. Like this is how this whole thing was, was enabled. And this is like kind of the original planet scale raider task uh, that's been going on for God, like over 10, 15 years now. And the last one of these points that's really important one is that machine learning is a really creative process and you need to extend your UX family. So this isn't something random or something you can't understand that the engineers do over in the other room. This is a creative process all the way through. And so what we do on our team is a lot of things about envisioning what this experience could be and working with our engineers to hopefully not exactly prescribe to them exactly how something would work, but to inspire them in a lot of ways to start exploring this space. Machine learning engineering is extremely creative. Like it's not rote engineering in any way. And there's a lot of exploration in there. And so being really close to the engineers who are, who are building this stuff from the beginning and talking to them about the intent of the design and walking with them through these iterations is extremely important. So this is, again, some early stuff with the Google Lens sketches where we're just kind of talking about and sketching and trying to understand it. You know, and then it shows up later down the road. We we're able to like prototype a lot of this along the way. And there's a lot of back and forth between engineering and UX to get this right. So those are kind of a whirlwind through a bunch of myths that we've tried to dispel and how the work hopefully doesn't and does change. And the last section we're going to close, and Josh is going to talk a bit about the responsibility that comes 
uh, when you're a UXer and you're designing uh, with AI and ML? Thanks, Jess. So make this quick. This is a topic that kind of has taken over my, my life. It's kind of become my life's work in many ways. Everything we've kind of covered so far really rolls back to this pipeline, or what seems like it could be perceived as a pipeline, where data comes in, and models are trained, and media can be ranked or sorted or filtered, and people can see it. And often we talk about it, like, like Jess touched on in the myths section, that you know, just like data at scale is neutral and opinionless, and somehow we can get our frail human judgment out of that process. And, and it's not true. Like We choose where all of the data come from. So we get to choose what good looks like. And we determine those success criteria and what truth is. You know, When raiders go through and label stuff, they're doing so based on protocols that have been designed by a person with success criteria and evaluations that have been deemed correct by people using data that has been sourced by people and originally captured by people. And then we get affected. And it's not a pipeline. It's a feedback loop. When we see those results, when we experience these media in our everyday lives, and we see the predictions that are sometimes kind of hidden, it affects us. And it goes back to the source, because it creates the next round of the photo, or the text, or the article, or the movie, or whatever it might be that changes our opinion about where we get data the next time, and what success looks like the next time. And so just a really quick, because I know we're getting close to time. But a really quick exercise that I, I run teams through now at Google, this is becoming a company-wide effort to make sure that fairness is integrated into everything we do as a company. But it's really uncomfortable. So I'm going to sort of try to do a little bit of a lead by example. It starts by asking yourself who you are. Now, like we're not our external traits. We are not this representation. We are more complex beings than that, obviously. But it would be wrong to assume that others are blind to our characteristics. So there are aspects of me, the person you're looking at, that fall into a normative majority category in tech work. I'm white. I'm a cisgendered male. I'm heterosexual. I'm married. I have a good job. Like, OK, that puts me in a pretty, pretty majority category. There's other aspects that maybe are a bit hidden beneath the surface. I've covered a couple of them, actually. I'm legally blind. I'm way too tall. Uh, I, uh, I come from a cultural minority. I was raised Jewish. And so those things, those things are part of me. Um, and unfortunately, we do this, this little process. I find many people do this process of saying, OK, well, I'm this complex entity, but then there's everybody else, and we can fit into some sort of a neat bucket. And that's, that's not true. By calling to attention these characteristics and these differences and recognizing that everyone is that complex, my hope is that as a UX community, we can help everyone understand that the world is a lot more like this, much more multifaceted and, and interrelated, where we have similarities and we have differences. And being a human-centered practitioner doesn't mean hiding from these differences or trying to believe that inclusion or inclusive design is about believing everyone's the same and homogeneity is the goal. It's actually highlighting and celebrating our differences, calling them out as things to be respected and cherished. So just to close out a little bit of a video, uh, this is something we released uh, as part of a blog post with a Google research blog. I guess it was last week. And a video to kind of walk through um, some ways that we've noticed interesting differences, cultural differences, um, that have given us opportunities to take a second look at, at, uh, at our data and how we perceive uh, our data and how it's going to train models in the future. Let's play a game. Close your eyes and picture a shoe. OK, did anyone picture this? This? How about this? We may not even know why, but each of us is biased toward one shoe over the others. Now imagine that you're trying to teach a computer to recognize a shoe. You may end up exposing it to your own bias. That's how bias happens in machine learning. But first, what is machine learning? Well, it's used in a lot of technology we use today. Machine learning helps us get from place to place, gives us suggestions, translates stuff, even understands what you say to it. How does it work? With traditional programming, people hand code the solution to a problem, step by step. With machine learning, 
computers learn the solution by finding patterns in data. So it's easy to think there's no human bias in that. But just because something is based on data doesn't automatically make it neutral. Even with good intentions, it's impossible to separate ourselves from our own human biases. So our human biases become part of the technology we create in many different ways. There's interaction bias, like this recent game where people were asked to draw shoes for the computer. Most people drew ones like this. So as more people interacted with the game, the computer didn't even recognize these. Latent bias. For example, if you were training a computer on what a physicist looks like, and you're using pictures of past physicists, your algorithm will end up with a latent bias, skewing towards men. And selection bias. Say you're training a model to recognize faces. Whether you grab images from the internet or your own photo library, are you making sure to select photos that represent everyone? Since some of our most advanced products use machine learning, we've been working to prevent that technology from perpetuating negative human bias. From tackling offensive or clearly misleading information from appearing at the top of your search results page, to adding a feedback tool on the search bar so people can flag hateful or inappropriate autocomplete suggestions. It's a complex issue and there's no magic bullet, but it starts with all of us being aware of it so we can all be part of the conversation because technology should work for everyone. So, thanks. so Jess is gonna take us home with a little recap of what we talked about today and then we'll open up to questions. So we just kind of want to close with a couple things with kind of a couple calls to action for everybody. So the first one is maybe not all that surprising is like stay human centered. Don't let anything about this new technology sway you from the stuff that you already know or else we're just going to end up making like really fancy powerful systems to address needs that don't exist. Uh, the second part is you got to fake it till you make it. So this is the chatbots like get the other person in the other room simulating these systems really early on and have people bring in their own examples into user testing. Uh, so that you can actually get a view into what this world you're trying to build might look like. Uh, because otherwise, you're going to have to wait until this extremely expensive thing is built, and nobody's going to want to actually fix it. And the third big one is you have to think about the data and the algorithms. And just like we always have with user research, is you've got to think about who you're talking to and who they represent. And are you building something that's really going to be inclusive, and it's going to build for everyone, and it's going to be great and make people's lives better? Uh, and with that, I guess I'll say thank you, and we'll start to do questions. Yeah, so just to repeat the question for everybody. Um, you were saying a lot of the advice we were talking about is, is going to be good for individual UXers, but when you're trying to put together a team that can contend with each of our individual biases, how do you, how do you find the right makeup of the team? Is that, right. yeah. Well, it's complicated. Um, so much of what I consider a successful interaction with a team is how comfortable they are calling out the assumptions that are being made in just normal conversation. One of the things that I do at Google is uh, this facilitation called bias busting, uh, where we get together and we try to create an environment where nothing leaves the room, where we people are safe to ask questions and share stories. I know there was a version of that that might have been shared more broadly by somebody a couple weeks ago. Um, but really, the goal of this, of this session is to be able to create a space where we can um, walk through scenarios, um, talk about how we perceive those, and how we might act as advocates on behalf of the people that we work with to create a space where people feel safe to bring their whole selves to work. In my experience, almost always comes from this dynamic of leaders, and anybody can be a leader, taking the step of calling out their own assumptions and their own vulnerabilities and the things that they've gotten wrong. And the most trust I've ever been able to earn in this space is being able to, to sort of lead by example in that respect and create more space for other people to, to share their stories and share their voices. The only way you can build effective machine learning systems and effective products is if you get representation that is aware of its own lack of representation, if that makes sense.
So safe space, check your assumptions, document your assumptions, document, document them again, and make sure you're going outside of your comfort zone. Jess and I agree with each other way too much, so we make sure that we don't only rely on each other's opinion when we're asking each other to. Hi, my name is Luis. Uh, so this is on the realm of recommendations, right? I'm making a prediction that you're gonna like something. How do you convince or how do you tell a person that is getting a recommendation that what the machine is saying is actually going to be better for him or that he's going to like that more? Uh, how, how do you, how do you uh, communicate this uh, recommendation properly to a person? Yeah, this is actually one of the big unsolved problems, I think, uh, in AI right now. Uh, because one is uh, a lot of times we don't even communicate how confident we are in a prediction. Uh, then it's hard to predict, to actually communicate why you gave the prediction. So this is something we didn't get into, but remember the, uh, the, the neural, the layers and the dog versus cat thing? Uh, so those layers oftentimes actually abstract the features into something that's not really human readable. Uh, so the models are learning something that would be extremely difficult to communicate to another human being. Uh, my favorite example is there's this research paper put out that was, uh, they were training a model to try to count zebras in a herd, which is like hard to do. Uh, and when they went and tried to inspect the model, they basically found the thing that the model was keying in on is this random patch, like right in front of the hind leg of all the zebras. Like that was the thing distinguished all of them. That was like the most important thing in the model, not like anything that a human would even recognize or key in on or, or talk about. And so a big challenge is like even communicating to them why we gave that recommendation, because we may not know. Um, this is, a, this is an area that's like completely open. I don't think anybody's figured it out well at all yet. And then there's the whole thing of like, did I get a recommendation that I don't like or that you think is good for me and I, is not good for me? What do I do now? Usually the answer right now is nothing or scroll further or whatever. <laughs> um, and so we need, to have, we need to actually figure out ways that people can give effective feedback uh, to these systems as well. And I would, just, I would add to that um, a couple of things that we're trying at least. Um, I think to Jess's point, if anybody claimed to be an expert about this, you should not trust them. So one is this concept that uh, I call kind of like a cognitive budget or cognitive currency. It's like if you imagine you gave like $10 to a person and they're like, all right, now you're going to learn how to use this system. And then you're like, all right, so there's a magical robot that's going to know exactly what you like at all times and it's going to tell you when to do what you're going to do. Like, then they would hand over nine of those dollars because that just blew their mind and it didn't make any sense. And they're left with a dollar left to use the rest of your app. That's not enough to actually do anything really successfully. So now you've put them at a disadvantage where you've put the, the AI as this magical omniscient thing and you've put the user at a disadvantage where they're not actually in a control state and they're also being asked to learn a bunch of new concepts and they just feel dumb. And like anybody who's run usability studies, people tend to blame themselves when they don't understand a system. So there's a kind of a question back is how do you sort of gracefully onboard someone such that they feel like they're in control and these decisions aren't just coming from nowhere? Big open area for research. Hey, um, I actually wish that I could hear more from the, uh, from the talk about like UX design and how that work with machine learning. So one of the example you show, I think I quite like it is how do you engage user to make choices to correcting the machine predictions? So can you tell me more of the example? How do you design to engage user? Like, I'm, I don't think we should live in the world where we leave everything for the machine. There gotta be a middle ground, an interface that give, give human like more inputs. Yeah, totally. One of the things that you're even starting starting down the path there is like you're making an assumption that you'd rather empower a person rather than automate away their decisions. So you're already doing a thing that's ahead of where many people start their product design process, which is how can we automate something so that people aren't doing it anymore? One of the approaches that we like to take is looking at things like augmentation. Uh, and ways to, to figure out what people do and how you can extend their capability. I mean, things like the um, I mean, Google Photos is actually ripe with lots of good examples to draw from with this that are springing to mind at least. Or like, um, it's not that being able to go and do like a natural language search for um, you know red jacket or park or tree 
is um, something that is automating away someone's, someone's individual capability. It's instead taking a really burdensome task that feels like a chore when you want to do it. Like, wow, where was that? What was that photo? We were at the park and we were doing that thing and he was wearing that jacket. Now I can, I can augment my ability to, one, save me time, success metric, um, do something that I would have spent a bunch of time that would have felt burdensome otherwise, um, and get me back to my life, not sort of stuck in technology land. Um, examples springing to your mind? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> again, it's, it's a lot of, there's a lot of challenge there. And, and again, I think it's about the feedback that somebody can give, like the, the choices that they have. Um, but then it's also interesting to design that for the model itself. Because if the people can actually give the model better feedback, the model can get better faster, and then the people don't have to give it feedback. Um, I think there's also a lot of just basic user research about like how do the people how do people even want to interact with the system like what do they want to be in control of versus not um, and a lot of that is just it's just user research basics um, one of the things we've kind of keyed in on here too like there have been kind of a few design questions is like um, a lot of the design is like it's just concept design it's like how do you actually frame this in a way that people can even wrap their heads around and know what to do with it and want it versus like actual, I would say, like UI or, or like interface design, a lot of them. So um, let me give you like an example of something I really wish to happen. So I bought like a uh, Roomba recently. And you know, Roomba often like go to random corners. And I wish that like this robot, I can like kick it and it's like learn the lesson and not never to go there. So can we design more of that, like getting f feedback from users and learn? So you're saying you want to kick more things? <laughs> if I understand you correctly, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That kick metric. Yeah, I don't know. You want to? Um, uh, yes. So a couple things there. Again, like that's a real design decision someone made about like um, just talked about perfection often being the goal. Like that that's a that's a mindset where someone's like, all right, how do we reduce enough bugs so that we can ship this thing, rather than how are we building the most resilient possible system? Not so it can withstand your kicks necessarily, but so that it can withstand error states. And error states or failure states are a critical part of the design process. There's actually a difference just to like call out one of our own pieces of tech. Like um, if, if Amazon Alexa or Echo like doesn't understand something, it actually will tell you. Whereas like if Google Home doesn't understand something, sometimes it just guesses. And that's kind of a weird, that's like a failure mode that puts the user in a situation where now they're like, oh man, now I have to speak more carefully when I engage the assistant. Like you're forcing the person to adapt. And that's not being very conscientious of the resilience of the system of how it's going to learn better. And it's not being conscientious of how the user is going to need to accommodate the technology's need rather than the technology accommodating the user's need. So really so much of this comes back to success criteria. Will we know we've shipped a good product if it's bug free? Or will we know we've shipped a good product if it can learn from all of the various mistakes that we can identify it's going to make? And how we'll track that. Thank you. How do you think about uh, data privacy and allowing on the UX side uh, users to either opt in or opt out of which data they want to share and when and how um, so they're not always leaving an unconscious, uh, perpetual data trail? Yeah, thank you. That, that's a really good question. Um, there's a lot of complexity here. A um, couple things I'll touch on. So one is that the cloud is not the only answer. Um, right now, people are really in this, like we're entering a world where like you have to give up all your data to get anything you want. That's the way the world works. And it doesn't have to work that way. And there's alternatives uh, that are coming. One of the most exciting things is something that we published about a little while ago called Federated Learning. Um, so this is a way uh, for actually various models to learn, um, to then send their learnings to the cloud in a way that could never be tied back to an individual, um, that improves what we call like a global model, that then sends that down to everybody. Sorry, I'm, I'm doing this meaning like cloud and phones. Um, and so um, this is actually some stuff that's extremely cutting edge, but it could essentially give us all the benefits of the machine learning and AI systems with none of the, well, not none, but a greatly reduced risk of uh, pri uh, uh, greatly improved privacy. Um, I think one of the other really big complexities is that oftentimes these models need all the data. 
So if you said, like, if I wanted to do one with the map or whatever, and you're like, you know what? I'd prefer it didn't know exactly like my home location, or I'd prefer it didn't know, you know, maybe my calendar schedule or something like that. Like you, you can't pull that out of the model. The model doesn't work anymore. The model understands all the things it needs and can't do anything without it. Um, this is an area just kind of that there's no alternative to right now, uh, but it's a really interesting thing of like, could I turn something on and off and could I actually understand how that would change things? Because maybe I don't want it because it would actually make the experience terrible for me. Or maybe I'm okay with that. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say one uh, in-product example of what Jess is talking about with federated learning is Gboard. And this is one of the, actually, this actually is a funny example where the world just assumed that Google released a keyboard that uh, you're like, oh, it's, it's a good keyboard, so I guess I'll just give Google all of the things that I'm typing and that'll be worth it. Like, no. Actually, all of the, the personal data is stored locally on device. And using this federated learning technique, what happens is there's a, a model that exists just on the phone that's being optimized and personalized. And then there's a, this essentially a bunch of abstraction that happens so that no personally identifying information gets built back. So everyone can benefit by building a more robust keyboard model with prediction systems that have nothing to do with any identifiable information but that user has their own custom model. It's like having your own personal AI in your keyboard. But it's an area where we didn't, we didn't talk about it. We just said, like, here's an awesome piece of technology. Um, and so communicating to your user when their data is in whatever shape, like, don't just rely on a EULA. Like, make that part of your brand story. That's something that, like, will, will resonate with people because privacy and control is, like, it's meaningful. Yeah, I, I just want to attack one, one more thing on there, too, is, Sometimes we've also heard that uh, you know people don't care about privacy or we're in a post-privacy world or blah, 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 blah. And uh, it's just not true. And, and we hear it all the time in our own user studies that people care a lot and are very interested in anything that's privacy preserving. So my little tack on that. So um, my question, I guess, has to do with user sophistication and how you design for that in these um, artificial intelligence systems. Um, how do you sort of get an unsophisticated user the same kinds of result out of a out of a system that an expert would get, for example, if they were using it? Do you do it on the UX side? Do you do it on sort of the, the model side? There's a couple things. So one is that there are systems both for experts and for non-experts. And like the definition of expert kind of varies there. Um, another effort we kicked off recently is called PAIR. It's the People and AI Research Initiative. And so this is actually looking at a lot of how do we bring human-centered design closer to the research scientists that are doing this. And, one of the really interesting areas there is like what we call augmenting expert intelligence. So this would be like something like helping a doctor read x-rays. So there's deep domain expertise. There's a lot of knowledge there. It's OK to use jargon. It's OK to have a very dense display and all those kind of things. Um, and then there's something more like, I would say, like the Google Assistant or Siri or Cortana that you're supposed to be able to kind of walk up and use, and anybody can do that. Um, I think in a lot of ways, it's kind of a question of, um, I don't know. I, I guess personally, I feel like if somebody's not an expert user, but they're getting value out of it and are happy and it's doing the things they want, like you, you did it, you won, you got it. And um, I think that is a challenge, though. I, I mean, I think that's a challenge before AI and ML of, of like, but we built these features that will make your life really great if you just like read the five steps in the tutorial. And, and that kind of doesn't change of like, I, I mean, I, I don't think that changes that much with AI and ML. All right. Well. Thank you all. Thank you, Josh and Jess. We uh, really hope that you found some new ways to think about uh, machine learning and AI and um, have some tools that you can take back to the work that you do um, on a daily basis. Uh, we have another uh, event next month, so um, stay tuned for, uh, for what's coming. We have uh, Design is Immersive. Um, Marsha Haverty from Autodesk is coming, and we'll have more coming in the fall. So thank you all for joining us, and um, we'll, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.